Good morning, everyone, and happy Friday. Thank you for joining us. We didn't know for sure if anyone was still working today. Um, this is Penny, and I am the Conservation Training and Membership Services Coordinator at Wisconsin Land and Water. And today our presenter will be Andy Hart from NRCS. And before we begin, um, if you haven't joined us, I just want to go over a few little things and then we'll get started. On your GoToMeeting drop-down box, if you see there's a double arrow up at the top, if you click that, it will minimize your screen and then you will be able to see the PowerPoint presentation as it goes. And we will be recording this webinar like we do most of our webinars, and then we will post it in the near future. It may be 2020 before we get to that, but that will be posted on the Wisconsin Land and Water Media website. And I'll send out an announcement with our future webinar announcements, but it will be recorded so you can watch it again and again and again. And I think that is about it. Um, Andy, are you ready to take over? You can go ahead, Andy. Oh, can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Um, so my name is Andy Hart. I'm the um, state forester for NRCS here in Wisconsin. Uh, the original plan today, as you saw in the advertisement, was about some new practice or new ser payment scenarios that we were going to be having this year on planting trees in ash and reed canary. Um, there's a little bit of a, with all the changes with CART and all, all the things going on, it kind of uh, fell to the background. So it's it's going to be there next year. But when we get to um, tree and shrub planting, I'll kind of go where here's like the nearest uh, scenario if, if somebody were to want to do something like that. I know that a few of the tribes and a few of the um, uh, DCs out there have already kind of talked to people about using uh, that practice scenario. So I apologize, but the rest of the, um, I'm basically just gonna be going over all of the EQIP um, practices and uh, and EQIP, kind of a very basic general overview of them and kind of explain, uh, kind of t hit some of the scenarios that are, that are out there that are maybe intuitive by the name. So with that, I'll just get started. You can feel free to um, ask questions as we go, or as uh, Penny said, you can sure put it in chat and she'll uh, let me know when uh, somebody has a message for a question for me to answer. So um, <clears throat> so again, we're gonna talk about forest environmental quality incentive program, the EQIP and forestry practices and scenarios. Um, again, it's a brief overview. There's a lot to these uh, programs um, and I'm going to be looking at more of the, uh, only at really the technical end and touch very little if at all on programs only when it's um, absolutely necessary like in the next slide. And there we go. So uh, as most everyone, most people from NRCS hopefully you know already to be eligible for equip forestry practices, the landowner has to have an approved forest management plan. Uh, those can be, uh, our plan is the CAP 106 forest management plan. Um, there's a stewardship plan, um, which NRCS provides a national um, template. Um, this was also, also include managed forest law. Um, and if a client has a plan that does not include in the resource concern that meets NRCS criteria, the forest management plan would need to be updated to show that resource concern. So a lot of times um, plans are written you know, could have been written 10 years ago and scenarios uh, or practices didn't exist or they didn't really know about NRCS programs. So they may have had that problem, but they may not have put it in their um, MFL plan, for example, or an older CAP 106. And they would have to basically um, do an amendment to that plan showing that the resource concern exists. Equip practice and scenarios available for financial assistance. So. The CAP 106, as we know, has to be written by uh, TSPs, and I put if NRCS funded because if we are, uh, we can write MFL plans, but they have to uh, be written by a TSP who is also a certified plan writer with the DNR. Um, a CAP 106 can be used to renew MFL plans when expiring um, and to write a new MFL plan for them. It is prohibited to write a CAP 106 when the landowner has existing MFL plans as they are already eligible. Um, and the uh, scenario payments are almost always based on um, acres, but there's a few that aren't, and we'll kind of go over those as, as we make it through these. So the key note is all the uh, forestry practices need a plan. 
Um, and then one of the first and probably the most uh, most commonly used um, resource concern is uh, forest stand or uh, is standard is forest stand improvement. And um, I think trying to uh, Im impress on people, uh, especially clients and stuff, about our system of how, how equip is used to address resource concerns. So um, we have on the right hand side, uh, typically it's degraded plant condition, inadequate structure and composition, degraded plant condition, excessive plant pressure, degraded plant condition, plant productivity and health. Uh, there's wildfire hazard, uh, fish and wildlife, um, cover and shelter, as well as habitat continuity. Um, these are typically to, figured out during the inventory process. So when we pay a TSP to do an inventory, they are like, for example, degraded plant condition, um, uh, uh, inadequate structure and composition. Um, you're usually looking at a species composition that is not as productive as another one. And a, a little bit is based on uh, the preference of where the landowner would like to go with his uh, forest management. Um, and let's see. And um, and so then some of the um, cookbook uh, actual scenarios, another a little disclaimer is that these are these are last year's prices. And I just show these up here uh, mostly kind of just give you an idea. A lot of it doesn't change, but um, don't take, this isn't, uh, this is 2019. Like I said, very little has changed, but uh, just so you know, um, the HU rates is historically underserved. Um, and you can talk to your, uh, your field offices or um, district conservationists about how that uh, applies for our clients. Um, some of the uh, scenarios that we have are uh, pre-commercial thinning with hand tools, competition control, mechanical light equipment, creating patch clear cuts. Um, I think the one that's least intuitive is uh, thinning for wildlife and forest health. Um, it's starting to get out there that um, this one can be used for both. It's really the focus is on two disease issues. One of them is emerald ash borer. And the idea is, is that we would like uh, to go in and do some harvesting of their ash trees prior to being dead. Um, and hopefully they would follow up with a planting scenario or a natural regen um, to, to essentially start changing the species composition. And that's to lessen the impact of when it actually comes to the area because uh, all the places I've seen so far, it's just virtually wipes out the area. Um, and then that creates its own set of resource con uh, concerns over time. Um, Two other ones that are more dealing with um, a mature forest is uh, the marking even uneven aged and even aged. Another um, uh, pra uh, practice standard that we use is forest trails and landings. Um, there's also a forest land uh, trails and landings closure uh, scenario. And basically it's when to choose road trails and landings or closure. A lot of times for closure, it's basically Really, the biggest difference is, is that the landowner would be setting us uh, basically putting their road to bed for a number of years. Um, they can come back and use that road, um, but they would revegetate it and rehabilitate it and basically let it let it go and uh, not have vehicle traffic on it and put water bars in and things like that. As you can see, there's kind of a lot of resource concerns for this. There is a bulletin um, if anybody's working with trails and landings. Uh, Basically, it kind of states that there's resources concerns directly related to um, forest trails and landings, for example, the erosion, um, sediment going into streams, things like that off of a road. But you can also use this to address another resource concern. So if you have a timber stand um, that you need to get to to address a resource concern, that would make it eligible for um, trails and landings. I think one of the most important things to remember for this uh, practice is um, is that these are not at all made for um, basically touring a property or creating um, a trail system for a property. This is basically the minimum amount of trails and landings that you can that you need to um, get the project done. So uh, a lot of times skitters and equipment can go a quarter mile. So you got to work with a uh, your local DNR forester a little bit, and your um, NRCS uh, engineers have a lot of um, good input on that. So work with those those folks to get it. And usually it's, um, like I said, it's a minimum amount of road to, to make something happen. Um, and then the dripless area for next year, we'll be working on getting um, something that addresses the um, unique situations there with the roads there, uh, with all the hills and whatnot.
but you can see there's a lot of resource concerns um, for forest trails and landings, water quality degradation, degraded, degraded plant condition, degraded plant, uh, uh, undesirable plant productivity, excessive plant pressure, inadequate structure and composition, wildlife hazard, excessive biomass. The, the reason why the list is so big is because a lot of times you can use it to address a different resource concern. And if anybody would like the um, uh, uh, the bulletin, I can send that out again and I've, and put it in the, or put it in the weekly again so people can see that because I know it people don't memorize this stuff. Um, choose, uh, like saying earlier, choose road trails and landing closure if the road is infrequently used for forest activities. Uh, you can see the picture on the left. Um, they basically are probably going into this stand maybe every 10 or 15 years. Um, I've seen it out west where they, they, they put trees and stuff in there. Um, usually the trees don't get large enough to become mercantable. Uh, but it is a way they basically do that so that it keeps traffic off of it. Um, but it definitely never gets into the range of um, growing sizable trees for actually timber. Uh, another thing to consider uh, for roads, trails, and landings is that um, in, in wetlands and wetter areas, hy uh, uh, hy hydraulic, hydraulic soils, um, the idea is really just not putting in, there's maybe some brush clearing and stuff like that, but basically the focus is to do the logging in the winter. Um, which is getting uh, a little bit more difficult with the weird uh, weather and climate that we're getting. So, um, but it's uh, probably the best way to handle like working in wet areas is just wait for the winter and they might have to pause it because one winter it might not freeze. And I know that creates a problem with contracting, but that's kind of how the, the, the world of logging kind of works. Um, some of the scenarios that we have for that is um, trails and landing installation, uh, trail, trail erosion control with vegetations on slopes less than 35, trail and erosion control with vegetation slopes over greater than 35%, and grading and shaping with vegetative establishment. The idea is, is basically to not have roads that are uh, creating um, rills that become gullies and stop all the erosion um, on slopes and to get vegetation on the soil to minimize erosion. The best resources uh, that I have for um, when you're working with forest trails and landings is the best management practices for water quality handbook field manual. Um, if people don't have that, it's online. Just go to the WDNR uh, website, uh, as well as the Wisconsin Forest Management Guidelines. Both of these have uh, chapters um, dedicated to to this issue of roads. Um, it's a it's always a hot topic. Um, I don't know since I started my career, there's always issues uh, trying to have the least amount of impact. The other uh, item when I think about roads and working in forest stands is you're actually trying to limit the amount of entries that you have um, in a forest. So uh, so uh, for example, I was in Krivitz working with Dan Hoff, uh, the uh, Rough Grouse Society, while at uh, Forester, and we were basically working with a customer where the MFL plan kind of said, oh, they need to harvest here um, this next year and four years later in another spot. Um, a lot of times it's, it's a, a, economically it's more efficient, but it's also better for lessening the amount of impacts and equipment that go into uh, the forest and creating things like in the middle picture like that. Uh, another um, uh, Practice standard we have is uh, 612 tree and shrub establishment. Um, that's just that's tree planting. Um, the resource concerns for 612 is uh, uh, there's quite a few: um, soil erosion, uh, wind erosion, sheet and reel erosion, runoff flooding or ponding, excessive sediment and surface water, degraded plant condition, undesirable plant productivity and health. Degraded plant condition, inadequate structure and composition, uh, fish and wildlife, of course, ha uh, inadequate habitat and food, as well as cover and shelter. Um, there's a lot of uh, um, resources, resource concerns that planting trees can, uh, can help with. I know that um, in different parts of the state, um, sometimes grasses and things work better. Um, I would, I, you guys know your areas better, and sometimes it's uh, Better to either do a combination or to do one or the other, um, but trees are definitely a, a part of um, helping all these. In the diagram there, um, like some of the things that, that trees can help with. Um, 
So some of the um, uh, payment scenarios that we have are individual tree and hand planting, uh, planting uh, conifers with bud caps, uh, hardwood mechanical planting, bare root with tree protectors, hardwood establishment, direct seeding, regen, hardwood establishment, direct seeding, and shrub planting. Um, now the next one, it's now statewide, and that's perimeter-based tree shrub regeneration area with protection. It's a mouthful, um, but that is essentially doing um, uh, keeping deer out of an area for natural regeneration only. Um, if a client would like to go in and plant uh, spe specific species afterwards or do other things in that area, that's great. But we, th at this point in the game, um, this is not made for us uh, when we're actually doing planting of seedlings that we don't, um, put, we're not using fences for this. So it's focused on natural regeneration. The two new scenarios that I was hoping to have this year, but it didn't happen was um, planting trees and reed canary grass and also planting trees and monotypical ash stands. Um, the reason we needed a different scenario for that is that those are very difficult areas for one to plant and we were trying to get bigger trees so that um, the to lessen the amount of time that the um, for example the the trees can get past the reed canary grass um, and we've done a few experiments we're kind of waiting to see the results on some tribal uh, projects for that um, as well as ones in ash there and that's the same with ash as we're trying to get trees that are a little bit bigger because we're concerned especially in black ash uh, that if all the trees dies, it's going to change the hydrological cycle, and um, and a lot of times what's going to move in actually is going to be alder and uh, reed canary grass because it gets carried along the stream. So we're just trying to be um, get ahead of that. The whole state is quarantined for emerald ash borer, so um, and I have that changed in um, the 2020 cookbook uh, that it's um, now statewide. It doesn't have to be in a certain distance from your um, area. So those ones, and if if you're going to, you, you can still work with um, in reed canary grass as well as the ash. And the nearest uh, uh, payment rate close to that is um, is the number eight hardwood mechanical planting bare root with uh, tree protectors, and that would be basically the closest uh, related payment scenario. We're not advertising this obviously anymore because we don't have it in 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 our uh, system. But I know that people have been working with tribes and uh, uh, specific clients with with this topic in mind. And so if you're in that kind of position where you're working with a landowner, um, just get a hold of me and I'll help uh, work it through. But it would be, we would just be focusing them on uh, using scenario eight. Um, woody residue treatment is another uh, 384, is another um, practice standard that we have at NRCS. Um, the resource concerns are un undesirable plant productivity and health, uh, inadequate structure and composition, excessive plant pressure, wildlife, wildfire hazard, excessive biomass, and then um, fish and wildlife. So this standard is essentially dealing with um, uh, treating the slash during a harvest. Um, a lot of times in certain uh, areas that are fire prone or whatever, uh, there might be just too much material on the ground and you're creating um, hazards either for insect and disease or for fire. So you can do things like um, lop and scatter that, you can pile and burn it, um, and that kind of gets us into the scenarios here. Uh, we have, I've yet to hear anybody using orchard or vineyard pruning or removal, um, but uh, that's out there. Uh, uh, restoration or conservation treatment following catastrophic events. This is predominantly the um, scenario that Wisconsin is using, and this is essentially uh, we've done it every year uh, and still working on it for uh, this year for last July storm. Um, but this is essentially following tornadoes or other types of catastrophic events where it just wipes out the forest. Um, and we can go in there and it would also uh, work as well for a, in a stand of emerald ash borer that was, um, that was uh, killed by the emerald ash borer. Um, for example, the other day I saw a stand where everything was probably two or three inch diameter and 15 feet tall. Those are the prime uh, tr trees that become fuel ladders into the canopy. So we'd want to be able to treat those um, for insect disease and things like that and to reduce the fire hazards. Um, that storm damage actually with the size and scope of it 
actually has a, a very large potential uh, to create some pretty um, nasty wildfires up there because there was uh, probably about 400,000 acres of down trees. Um, another scenario is, you know, woody residue or silviculture slash treatment light. Most loggers, you know, pretty much it's it's ingrained that when they're cutting trees that they lop and scatter, or pile it and burn it, or it's usually written into the plan how they're going to treat it. I don't know how often that's used. Um, because it seems like it's a natural part of uh, a logging operation because they can't leave it a looking visually uh, terrible to a landowner and they also understand like some of these uh, resource concerns and reducing some of the potential uh, problems they can have in the future. Um, chipping and hauling off site. Um, in the past you could chip and haul off site but you could not get paid for that so you couldn't take it to a um, cogen plant and I do believe there's a chip uh, plant up in Ashland and I, maybe there's other ones around the state but I, I don't know those um, but with the new farm bill uh, that would not be true anymore you would be able to uh, they would be able to sell the chips for um, for a value afterwards uh, when they do do something like that um, there is good for information in the standard about how much to leave because we basically don't want to take all the material off the ground um, because that's uh, soil health and gets into that as well as you know habitat for animals and things like that so um so chipping and hauling off site and then that would be the, the big change there is that you could actually sell it to a um, cogen plant or for energy use uh forest slash treatment medium and or heavy had a few of those that's most likely i think when we would be getting um calls especially if you're talking in um, jack pine plantations and sandy soils um that kind of thing Kind of goes hand in hand with the uh, the next uh, practice standard. It kind of goes with the uh, um, tree and shrub uh, establishment. Uh, a lot of times, um, basically, we can do site prep to be able to get the planting going on. Um, and the idea, I think, the the key to that during some of our trainings in the south um, west was, you know, when you're wondering what practice to use, to uh, you know, it, would I use brush management for that, or would I use um, forest stand improvement to to get enough open area to be able to to do the phys, actually physically do the planting and my recommendation to everybody is that when you when you're doing something that you basically do what so if if, if the if the goal is site prep use the site prep ones um if it, and it's a good way to be able to say no i don't think that the the payments are that different for the ones that are close but if you know it's it's not the end of the world to use something else and you know to, get advice from your um, from your ARC in your area and, and they'll let you know how they, they're doing it. But the idea is really as always like, what are you trying to do? And if your goal is um, tree and shrub site preparation, this is the standard you should use. As you can see, uh, the resource concerns um, for that, sheet, sheet and really erosion. So the usual, most times with, um, uh, with 490, I mean, it's, well, it should be maybe within six months at most a year to when you plant. So the idea is to, when you're looking at applying this is to um, try to limit the amount of exposed soil for um, as much as possible. Uh, so it addresses that. Um, some of these resource concerns, um, I have a little, uh, miss. I, I don't quite understand um, where they're at because the, um, because the amount of time that the actual soil is exposed is, is, is very little, but a lot of it is, is getting weeds out. Uh, there's um, site prep up north sometimes for aspen where they're really just going by and um, scarifying the soil. There's actually no physical planting. It can be done for uh, natural regen, it sort of stimulates that to grow. Um, other other um, resource concerns is uh, plant productivity and health, inadequate structure and composition, excessive plant pressure, um, and then fish and wildlife, inadequate habitat, food, inadequate habitat, cover and shelter. Um, and a lot of these, as we all, I think we all have heard that um, there's a new list of resource concerns coming out um, and uh, I haven't gotten those. So, but that will be getting out to everybody once, once um, national releases it. Um, but some of these may switch up, but it hasn't, it's mostly become more uh, split versus lumped, so there's going to be more specific uh, items for icing soil health and a few other things. Um, let's see, 
So the tree and shrub site prep, um, it really it just depends on what system they plan on using and that should all be in the plan um, or you work with the TSP or your DNR Forester, uh, you know, mechanical heavy machinery, mechanical light or moderate machinery, chemical ground application, chemical hand application. I think they call that like hack and squirt here, something like that, where they go back, they cut, um, cut stuff and uh, apply an herbicide to it. Um, and then as well as uh, windbreak um, site prep, you can use this standard to do site prep for windbreaks. Tree and shrub pruning, um, you know, that happens a lot in, uh, I, I believe, mostly in the southern part of the state. Um, uh, and we use it a lot of times for forest, uh, for um, plant production, health and production. Uh, really, when you're doing it for like walnuts, a lot of it is, is you're really increasing productivity and increasing the value uh, over a long period of time. Uh, the one thing I did want to point out based on this picture here is that this pruning also is the branches above ground, but this is also a uh, root pruning. Uh, there's a scenario for that. And you can see in the picture uh, in the center that is oak wilt moving into the forest. And uh, essentially they take that machine on the left and they cut a trench because the, um, the disease passes through the root system. So they're, what they're trying to do is, uh, is cut a line through that to uh, stop it transmitting through the roots. Um, if you remember, we were talking about, um, uh, let's see, uh, forest stand improvement. There is also in thinning for wildlife and forest health, and that one is also a um, is also for oak wilt, and that's a different method, but with the same concept. So what they're doing in the forest stand improvement is they're basically girdling trees uh, a tree length or two away. Um, I have to look at the, there's an oak wilt tech note that I would look at um, to get the specifics, but that'll tell you're basically creating a dead zone where the roots are intermingling basically with a dead tree and then those then those diseases and vectors cannot pass through the dead zone of the trees that you created um this one's a really hard one um i've worked with um the dane county on one of these this one's really hard uh because with the way that um contracting is uh, it takes a year um typically they move every year um so I'm finding that it, um, and I would work with your ARC to make sure that this is how they would like to go through with it. But I, I basically would try to make the area a little bit bigger than what it shows. Like if you see this dead zone here, I'd go maybe a, a couple trees uh, distances out just to include that because if you have it, it is most likely going to be moving uh, fast and it's going to be within a year. Um, I think on the, one of the tribal projects we had, we were playing basically catch up every time because it would, you know, by the time they get there, it had already moved. And by the time they, you know, change that. Anyways, it kept moving and it's very tough to uh, keep track of. But um, the root pruning is something that I don't know that anyone's ever uh, scheduled yet. I haven't heard. Um, here's some of the scenarios for it. Uh, it's pruning fire hazard uh, for fire hazards. Um, uh, and that's essentially just taking out, especially in like um, spruce and conifers and stuff like that. That's basically just thinning from thinning the branches above so that ground fires don't jump in or uh, ground fire. Yes, yeah, so ground fires don't jump into the crown. Uh, there is pruning for low height, pruning for high height. I believe that's like, you know, one's 10 feet, the other's 18 feet. And then, of course, the uh, what I was talking about a lot before was the root pruning for oak wilt control. 660, uh, there's some associated practices with that. I'm not really gonna cover that in this, uh, this conversation, but uh, the resource concerns is undesirable plant productivity and health, inadequate structure and composition, wildfire hazard, um, excessive, bio, excessive biomass uh, accumulation. And then of course, when we're talking about um, uh, oak wilt, it's going to be excessive plant and pest pressure. Uh, another uh, practice standard um, that is in uh, the forestry wheeled house is um, doing windbreaks and shelter belt establishments. Um, that's uh, 380. Uh, it, I'm kind of surprised uh, at how we're not really using this standard all that much, but we're working with um, a group out of the Central Sands to um, to start working with this scenario a little bit more. Um, the problem I, my understanding of the problem in the past was that our, 
our practice standard was um, extremely inflexible. And um, that one is actually being reviewed at the national level. And it's going to be uh, a little bit more flexible, um, both in species, but also in amount of rows. Um, and I think it's actually better, better written and a little more um, up to date for what's going on. Because I do remember having a, a few people that, a uh, few clients that were looking in, they had a design by uh, specialists of windbreaks and they design these, what I would call the Cadillac of windbreaks. And um, sometimes we can't pay for part of it because of certain issues. And I hope that when that new standard comes out, we'll do some training on that and get that out to some of our partners to um, start letting our clients know that this is available. Uh, you know, one of the biggest ones for that uh, resource concerns for that is wind erosion, uh, livestock production limitation, inadequate, inadequate shelter, um, inefficient energy use. Uh, this is sort of creating windbreaks around your buildings and stuff like that. And two, actually, uh, probably two of the most common uh, practices are most used, I believe, was definitely the brush management 314 and the herbaceous weed control 315. Um, I didn't really get into the resource concerns with this one. I was just kind of uh, talking about this one because it happens in a lot of the other land uses. Um, I think this is the one that's used most frequently um, by field staff. This is also the one that has, I would say, the most um, issues during contracting. Uh, a lot of these are a lot more work than people anticipate. Um, and so we are trying to actually come up with a, a, a change up the system a little to allow the field, the planners to have a bit more um, say uh, based on uh, some criteria whether that is it unacceptable or not, because a lot of times when the uh, it's so uh, infested that sometimes you can't really, you'll never really be able to change it back for sure uh, to something else. Um, so we want to just make sure that people uh, know what they're getting into. And we're, like I said, we're working on that to try to make it, give our planners a lot more um, decision making on that based on other, other um, conditions. Uh, another uh, forest. Uh, uh, practice in uh, is the riparian forest buffer. Um, I think this this particular standard, as well as if you are planting trees in a field, um, those don't uh, necessarily need a forest management plan. Obviously, there's nothing to if that landowner was his only land was this field that you can see in the picture. Um, you would not need a forest management at that at that point. However, if they say own both the field next to it, uh, if that gets into more forest, then we would have a plan for the whole area uh, and that would cover that. But um, that's something to keep in mind um, as you're going. Uh, there's other pra equip practices on forest lands uh, with NRCS. Um, we have prescribed burning and uh, most of the area, uh, all the arcs are very familiar with the standard. Uh, and you have to have a burn uh, plan and that, you, that goes to our wildlife biologist uh, Steve Birchton's um, conservation cover 327, critical area planting 342, um, access control uh, 560, and early ha successional habitat development um, is one. And another one is uh, access roads. Um, so if you're in a forest setting and you need an access road, um, in fact, we just switched the picture in the job sheet for that because it has like a all season road on there uh, for trails and landings. And that is not what that is. That was actually more of an access road. And when you're using access roads, it's typically going to be, I mean, there's a million situations out there, but in general, it's going to be getting from the main highway or road um, into, the for, into the property. And you're looking at somewhere around a hundred feet and a turnaround. Like again, we're in forestry, we are really trying to minimize the amount of roads and things like that that we establish in the forest because that actually ends up being the biggest point of uh, erosion and probably the probably the biggest resource concern that that happens on a forest is you typically erosion off roads um, let's see and so uh this is a picture of alaska um and i was just wondering i think that's kind of 
that was kind of a quick overview. Um, this is basically the, uh, kind of refreshing everybody's memory and, um, on the practices that we do have, and especially for our, our partners that are online, for them to have a better understanding of what's going on with um, forestry and how they can better use um, EQIP programs. Uh, in the future, I'll be doing a training for uh, uh, CSP enhancements. Um, that will be a, a bit more in depth because uh, a lot of that stuff is going to be new for us. Um, so yeah, this was really just a general overview. Um, if anybody is interested in um, more comprehensive trainings on any one of these standards, uh, I have slideshows that basically covers everything uh, within NRCS about those practice standards. So if, I'm wondering if anybody has any questions and um, hopefully there were people from the county online so they got to hear some of this stuff. Yep, we had some county staff as well. Excellent. So yeah. So it might have been might have been kind of a refresher for uh, most NRCS staff at this point, but um, it's always good to go over, especially the ones that aren't very intuitive. And I know that we were talking about having new scenarios that were supposed to be out and uh, you're gonna apologize, but we can still work with those situations. So um, just get a hold of me and uh, and I'll, I'll work with the ARC to uh, figure out how we'll make it happen, which I have a good plan. So if there's any questions, yeah, you can unmute yourself or you can send it through the chat line and then we'll read it. And just a reminder, this is being recorded. So we'll post that sometime in the next month or within the next month, I would think with the holidays and everything, we're getting behind a little bit on things like this. And I sent out a quick link for a short survey. If you could fill that out online, that would be great. And um, I'm just kind of waiting if anyone's gonna have any questions. Our next webinar is going to be on Friday, January 17th on alley cropping. Same time, 8.30, same link that you use. Again, that'll be recorded. And Rich Strait from the U.S. Fish Service is going to be um, our presenter that day. Where, where is he from? He's the uh, Agroforestry Center. I thought it was a U.S. Fish, isn't fish it? Fish and Wildlife? Yep. Oh, okay. Um, Excellent. Well, yeah, he's going to be, um, and then talking about, because some of that stuff is going to, uh, is going to be uh, available in CSP. Not that a lot of people um, use it or know about it, but um, we thought we would give uh, inf um, informational trainings if it ever does come up uh, on the agroforestry practices. And um, so we're going to have Savannah Institute do some in the future. Uh, and um, Richard Strait, and uh, at some point we'll get the, there's a new NRCS agroforester in Lincoln, Nebraska, and once he's kind of established, um, we'll be working a bit with him. So um, look forward to uh, everybody, talking to everybody again. So thanks very much. Okay, I think we're gonna call it a wrap. Thank you. Thank you everybody and have a great holiday. Yep, happy holidays everybody. Thank you, have a great day. Bye-bye.